Welcome to another episode of Jay Leno's Garage. You might remember a while back we did kind of the world premiere of the Kawasaki H2 and H2R here at the garage. Well, I, I had to get one. I'm sorry. It's, it's like the greatest bike. I had to get one. So I thought since we went over a lot of the technical stuff at that time, we will go over it again, maybe a little bit more depth a little bit later, and we'll ride this bike. Uh, let's talk about the history of the H2. I mean, this is a legendary motorcycle. It was the fastest accelerating bike ever when it came out. But let's meet our Kawasaki guy, Jeff Herzog. Jeff, how you doing? Good to see you. Good to see you. Okay, these are 72, and that's a 70. These are what, about 1,400 bucks when they were new? Yeah. Yeah, yep. who had $1,400? That was crazy. That was a lot of money back then. It was a lot of money yeah. back then. So, well, how old were you? How old were you when these were out? You must have been a teenager, right? Uh, so, yeah, this one is a 73, so oh, I would 73. have been. So, I would have been 12. Oh, 12. <laughs> okay, I would have been 23. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty good. But it was the fastest accelerating, and the evil handling actually kind of helped move the myth along, didn't it? It had that kind of flexible swing arm a little uh, bit. But a lot of guys got them to handle and, and stop pretty good. Uh, I think the myth was a lot worse than the actual product, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it, it was just no one had seen this kind of acceleration. Yeah. You know, the triple and individual pipes, it was light years ahead of everything else that right. was out there at, at the time. It was the fastest thing on the street. Just to put that in perspective, for if you're like under 30 years old, back in the 60s, cars were faster than motorcycles. They just were, GTOs, yep. Hemis, because you had Harleys and Triumphs and Honda 750s, but a good Roadrunner, a good Corvette, nine times out of 10 would outrun just about any motorcycle. I remember the Norton Commando in 68 or 69 was the fastest bike you could buy. And I think the top speed was 123, 124. So just to put that in, in perspective. So when this came out, oh my God, with 74 horsepower, which doesn't sound like anything now, but yeah. The Vincent Black Shadow had 55 horsepower, and that was considered crazy back in the 50s. So when these came along with 74 horsepower and a lightweight and, of course, that, that power band, nothing happened below three grand, and then, and then it yeah. just pinned it. I yeah. mean, it's the whole sensation. I've never driven one of these, and I'm going to drive it today, so I'm, I'm anxious to, uh, to ride it, not drive it. Uh, I'm anxious to try one of these, because this has always been one of those kind of bucket list bikes in, in my mind. And it's, it's still a good looking motorcycle. I, I like its stock, you know, as a kid, you want to put the expansion chambers and all that stuff on it. Yeah, yeah, but these were everywhere in SoCal and right. across the nation. They were the bike to have in theory. And of course, two strokes were outlawed after what, 75, 76, I think it was about the, uh, the, emission, the last yeah. two stroke emissions. They were, I mean, blue smoke coming out of the back, villagers chasing you with pitchforks. I mean, it got yeah. to be a little much. Boy, it was fun while it lasted. As you can see, disc brake. The early ones had a drum brake in front, didn't they? Uh, First generation, not, not yeah, the 750. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. correct. Yeah. yeah, it had a single disc up front. Still had the drum in the rear. Right. Now, they, obviously, two-stroke, 750cc, and this had the automatic lubrication, right? Obviously, many yeah. two-strokes, you had to mix the oil yeah. with the gas. You didn't have to do that with this. Each manufacturer had its own. Right. Those posi lube. Right. Uh, uh, all the different OEMs had a different version of their oil injection system. Right. And horrendous gas mileage. He's got like down into yeah. the teens. Yeah, <laughs> the power. The teens. So you have to understand the way Kawasaki thinks. They think different than the other manufacturers. They're always trying to one up, which I love. When the Honda 750 came out, uh, Kawasaki was actually ready with a four stroke, but I think it wasn't 900 cc's. And they figured, you know, let's wait. Let Honda have their thing, and then they came out with the 900 yep. after that. Yep. Z1. And of course, the, the Z1 was the future. That was the writing on the wall. But the last gasp was the two stroke. They knew emissions were coming. They knew you wouldn't be able to make these for much longer. So they just went kind of all out to build the fastest accelerating production motorcycle you could buy. And that's what this is the Kawasaki H2. It came with, what, a 400cc originally and a 500? Yep. Back in the day, back in the 60s and the early 70s, the British made the best chassis and the Japanese made the best engines. So f what they would do, a lot of guys would mate the two of them. There'd be, yeah. uh, uh, you know, English frames with Kawasaki motors, Honda motors, and that's what a lot of guys went racing with. It wasn't until mid-70s, early 80s that the Japanese frame technology began to equal and overtake some of the European manufacturers. I mean, it's going to be fun to, to uh, 
to ride one of these. Now, this is kickstart only, right? Uh, correct. Yeah, so I, 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 when was the last time we saw a kickstarter? So, uh, yeah. But the nice thing about two strokes, they're pretty easy. Just kind of drop your foot and vroom, and then they go, and they sound like bees in uh, a can. Triple pipes. Uh, it's right. rare to find one without aftermarket pipes on there. Right, everybody right. was always wanting even more power. No, it, it's just fun to see it stock. It's, it's hard to convey how fast this motorcycle was. I mean, it just blew off everything on the street back in the day. Uh, I mean, today, middleweight bikes blow the doors off. I mean, it's just, it's just funny how, how it changes. But it's not so much even how fast it was. It felt even faster. Because yeah. when that power band kicked in, it was like, whoa, you know, yeah. the front end would come up. I mean, just, yeah. just really, really exciting. Yeah, it was a very visceral, very... Yeah, uh, yeah, it, which is actually the image Kawasaki was uh, trying to convey. Yeah, and this and, is the same motor that, like, Yvonne Duhamel and uh, Gary Nixon, when he rode for yeah. us, they, these are the motors that they were riding. Really? Yeah, and, and the drag strip as well, Tony Nicosia, all the guys that, from the day. Yeah, This yeah. was the power plant of choice. Okay, we'll take this one for a ride. Then we come back. we get into that one. Ooh. All right, welcome back to 1972. Uh... As you see, we have our Kickstarter, which might be foreign to a lot of new bikers. When you start a Kickstarter bike, the GoPro is not 1972. That's fairly new, the camera. You know, you want to put this up. Turn your key on. Sometimes one or two kicks. Let's see what we got here. Now that sound, compared to a Harley or a Triumph, a lot of guys are in no way, but after a while, that got to be the sound. Those are stock pipes too, pretty loud. Nice thing about two strokes is hardly any compression, so you just drop your foot and they go. Let's uh I'm real excited to take this for a ride. I gotta admit, as I'm excited about riding this one as I am the new one. It's a bit like going back and seeing your whole your old high school girlfriend, and she looks exactly the same. So every motorcycle should drive a two-stroke at least once. It's just a fascinating experience. It's a whole different power band. It just comes on so hard all of a sudden when you hit 3,500 or so. Believe me, back in the 60s and 70s, there was nothing more embarrassing for Harley riders than to get blown off by a Japanese two-stroke. Oh my God, the indignity! That power man's right about here. Nice thing is, with the blue smoke, you kill all the mosquitoes behind you. I feel like uh, that scene in Mad Max, you know, where he goes, Lost in the V8 intercepted. You know, this bike kind of reminds me of the Lamborghini Miura in the sense that when it was new, it was flawed because you couldn't really run it in 10 tenths to saw all the faults. But if you rode it in 7 tenths, it was an absolute pleasure. And that's what this is. I, I find the braking fine. Braking is adequate. Handling is okay. Obviously, if you're trying to race somebody or compete, the flaws come through. But to ride it is a classic bike. It just makes an excellent fun ride for the classic. This, this, 
thing is a lot of fun. But boy, you can tell how far we've come with braking, and you know, they're just gonna, I'm, I'm pulling that front brake. And you know, and everything's a little, a little loosey-goosey, but that's the way they did it back in the day. I love this bike. I've gotta try and find one of these. I've gotta get me an H2. I, but now we're gonna go back and we'll try the, the new H2. You know something, I think that's gonna be a little scary. Come on, we'll take Grandpa back and put him in the garage. Well, what a lot of fun this thing is to ride. Boy, it brings back a lot of memories. It's, it's just so funny that what was once the fastest thing in the world is now, that's okay. I mean, now you're yeah. just keeping up with traffic. But it's still quick, and boy, it's a lot of fun to ride. You know, the vintage riding experience is really, really a fun thing, because it's just so different from that. Let's go over to the... Uh, yeah. H2. Often that was the king of the streets in 72. Right. Just think if you would have had this in 72. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you'd be dead. Yeah. You'd actually be dead. They do a track version of it called the H2R. 326 with the RAM. Oh, 326 with the RAM. The RAM. Okay. Yeah. You think about this. The company says, we just want to build the fastest, meanest bike we can. And that's what the H2R is. Yeah. And the only difference between the H2R and this is, is really camshafts. Head gasket, ECU. Exhaust. And, and exhaust, yep. and exhaust, just straight through exhaust. A supercharged motorcycle. Is it heavier than the standard sport bike? Yeah, it is a little bit, but I think that doesn't detract from it all. It still makes it the fastest accelerating motorcycle ever. It's, what is it, 525 pounds with fluid, which is yeah, not crazy yeah, either. There. The reason why it's a single-sided swing arm is because of the aerodynamics. Right. Because they wanted everything to be narrower. Usually it's, you know, to make it more exotic looking. A lot of the Italian marks do it that way. Right. But that's actually a functionality piece to bring everything together. So, so they, they wouldn't can... have the swing arm on this side to bring the exhaust in closer so that the profile was narrower right. for the aerodynamics. And the other thing is, it's not a race bike. It's a road bike. Yep. And consequently, handlebar height, you're not way down there. You're not totally hunched over in the thing. The other thing I find fascinating is that uh, Kawasaki has this supercharger. And originally, they went to aftermarket manufacturers saying, we need a supercharger that can do this, but we don't want to use an intercooler because it's too bulky. And everybody said, no, that can't be done. Yep. I'm sorry. So Kawasaki went to their own heavy industries, and they do, do jet turbines and all that, and devised this uh, supercharger, which moves air so quickly that it it alleviates the need for an intercooler, essentially, right? Yes. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the brilliant thing about it. They did it all in-house. Even at $25,000 a bike, I don't even think they break even on these because if this was a European motorcycle, it would be $150,000, easy. I mean, this trellis frame, look at these wells. Uh, we've been over this before. Plus, that supercharger moves, what I read, 200 liters of air per second. Yeah, at, 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 at full speed, yeah. the air coming through the intake right. is going over a thousand meters a second. Yeah, yeah, it's. And just... what you're hearing is is essentially, when on the overrun, you're hearing like little sonic booms because it's 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 moving yeah. so quickly. Yeah, the impeller. Yeah. The impeller itself is spinning faster than the speed of sound when it's up in the upper uh, uh, RPMs. Right. I mean, think about that. The, the supercharger is spinning 140,000 RPM. It's a brand new motor. Yep. Uh, much higher oil capacity, moves oil a lot quicker. It's a purpose-built motor specifically for this application. That's what I just find so fascinating. And yeah, it's the first use of a dog ring transmission by right. us in a production bike. And right. Yeah, the whole motor was, was made to take the supercharger power delivery because a lot of the bikes, you can take uh, some of our competitor stuff and put a supercharger on there and get the power out of it. Right. But the crankcase, the crank, uh, the rods, none of that, the tranny, none of that was made to right. take that kind of power. This thing was made to last, and it comes with a warranty. Right, yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's the amazing part. You know, if you really want to read a good technical piece on this motor and this motorcycle, uh, Kevin Cameron, he's the, uh, the guy at Psycho World. He writes an engineering column, and he's a brilliant engineer. He's one of those guys that can take uh, complicated engineering and break it down so guys like me can understand what the heck you're talking about. 
And I always go to him and his columns, and he wrote some brilliant stuff on this motorcycle. It's just a fascinating bike. I'm, I'm going to ride it for the very first time. Yeah, I, I've ordered one. You gotta, you gotta, you gotta do it. I believe this is the first Kawasaki motorcycle to use the river mark on the front. You know, when uh, Mr. Kawasaki started his business in the 1870s, he had a flag with that on it. And they only use that symbol, I guess, on their best products. And it's never been used on any of the engines or any of those bikes up to right now. Jesus! That Kawasaki gearbox with that reassuring kind of clunk noise, I actually like it. I must say I love the seat, it holds your hand. comes down to three words. I am not worthy. I mean, it's, I'm scaring myself to death on this thing. <laughs> it's the first time I've ridden it. It's gonna take a while to get used to it. But uh, it's the most powerful machine, powerful machine I've ever ridden. It's really unbelievable. Uh, that mid-range torque. To think that that H2 was the fastest thing in the world back in the day, I, think, I mean, it, it couldn't even hold, <laughs> unbelievable. Come on, we'll take over another little spin and we'll head back to the shop. Well, that's pretty incredible. You know, with the exception of maybe neutral being a little hard to find, it's unbelievable. I want to thank Kawasaki for building this motorcycle. You know, it's fascinating when you see a company just wants to build the best possible thing they can build, regardless of cost. And this is an expensive motorcycle, there's no doubt about it. Is that that much better than the ZX-14 or any of those? Yeah, but in a different way, you know. Um, it, it's just, uh, it's the fastest accelerating vehicle you can buy. Um, just the level of machine work and, and I mean, if you, you can just sit all day and look at these wells and look at the, uh, the brochure, the way that supercharger is put together, it just boggles the mind. You know, to, to move the bar this much forward all the time is really fascinating. I mean, this is, seems like a thousand years ahead of the original H2. You know, it's kind of wobbly and whatever. I, look, I'm not good enough to make this bike do what it can do, but uh, might be fun to die trying. <laughs> this is gonna get parked right next to the F1 McLaren. Oh yeah. See you guys next week. Mm-hmm. <laughs>